I arrived at Middlesex in 1967. And uh, what were your official positions at Middlesex? I was a biology instructor at that time. Okay. Um, so tell us a little bit about uh, where you grew up and how your childhood went. Okay. I grew up in a small coastal town in Maine. Uh, 24 students in my high school graduating class. I uh, spent most of my free time in the woods. Um, kind of got heavily involved in nature, which influenced uh, other directions I took in life. Um, biology being my major. And uh, very different times from now. Um, we got TV when I was 13. We had three channels. Um, my telephone number was 4799. It was on a party line, which meant that you had sometimes long waits to be able to pick up the phone and make a call. Um, what did your family do, John, in Maine? Uh, my mom was a housemaker. My father was a watchmaker. He ran a jewelry store of his own for a while and repaired watches. Um, four kids. Um, Neither of my parents went to college, but all four kids went to college. Um, it was, um, you know, looking back, it would be considered idyllic. I think there were, we didn't have the distractions of social media and smartphones and literally not really much TV even, so um, we lived outdoors a lot. Um, and our parents didn't seem to worry about it. I'd head out in the morning for the woods and the ponds, and my mother would say, be sure to be home for dinner. And that was, uh, that was how we lived. And then in school, I played basketball and baseball. Um, I ran cross country, uh, not because I wanted to, but because the basketball coach made all the basketball players run cross country, <laughs> get in shape for the season. Um, I had a few roles in my high school class. As I said, it wasn't very large. I was valedictorian of the class, uh, class president, and uh, didn't know anything about college. My high school principal said to me, <clears throat> I want you to apply to Bowdoin, Colby, and the University of Maine, and if you get into Bowdoin, go there. So well, that's what happened, and I did. It was a very different process from nowadays. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what year did you end up going to Bowdoin? 1962. And what was that like? Um, pretty challenging first year for a kid from a rural high school. Um, we were, I think, the same guy that taught chemistry, taught math. Um, so here I was trying to be a biology major without a real strong background in science. So my first, first year was a struggle, but I adapted pretty quickly. Got on the dean's list the sophomore, junior, senior year. But um, small school, there weren't a lot of small school, small high school people there. A lot of prep school people there. Um, a lot of differences in uh, income, which were very apparent there. Um, but uh, overall, I enjoyed it. I was, you kind of had to be a member of a fraternity at Bowdoin because they didn't have adequate housing for all the students. So I joined a fraternity and uh, had some social life through them, but I lived in dorms all the time. My junior year, my roommate and I could have had our pick of a room in the fraternity house. He wanted to go, I didn't. We could have had our pick because we had the highest uh, GPA of any of the juniors. But uh, I won over and we stayed in a dorm. And uh, senior year, we moved into a new building, a 16-story building called the Senior Center at that time. It's got a different name now. and. Uh, 
It was uh, four men, it was all men. Four men shared uh, a common living room and then each man had a bedroom of his own, so it was basically a five room suite. And uh, we were the second class, I think, that moved into that. And uh, so I, I enjoyed my time there. I had, interestingly, I had intended to play baseball or try to play baseball in college. They had a requirement at that time that everybody had to have physical education or be on a sport. So I went out for indoor track uh, my freshman year and uh, had some success with that. So I stayed with track for the rest of the four years. And so we would at least half the time our meets were away. So I'd be away on the weekends a lot when a lot of the social activity took place. So um, I'd get back to campus sometimes on a Saturday night and find the wreckage that was left behind. Um, but um, made some good friends and uh, got a good education there. So after college, can you just take us through that process of what it was like from graduating and then up until coming to Middlesex and getting in here? It was a fairly short time, actually. Um, it, it's, are those questions being picked up on this mic? Don't worry about that. Okay. After Bowdoin, I graduated in June of 66, and that same month I started at Wesleyan University. And um, went through Wesleyan, got a master's MAT in 1967. What is MAT? Master of Arts in Teaching. It was kind of a unique program that you took half subjects in your uh, major area, and then the other half, the courses were designed to make you a teacher. Um, graduated in June of 67 from Wesleyan. Got a call to come to Middlesex Community College, which at that time was at 425 Hunting Hill Avenue, the little white cape you've heard about. And uh, interviewed there with Wiley Peckham and Philip Wheaton. And they offered me a job. As? Biology instructor. Now, um, you just spoke of Riley Pickham. Um, I've, uh, in our past interviews with uh, James Childs, um, he said that Pickham was the master at finding things that you needed. Um, like, what did, like, do you have the same opinion in this case? Um, yeah, I can come to that in just a second, actually. Remind me to jump back to that. Uh, I wanted to tell you about what I thought about being offered the job. I was thinking to myself, this place isn't gonna last. Got 300 students, goes to work nights at Woodrow Wilson High School, doesn't even have a campus. And I thought, well, I'll do it. And then sometime later in life, I can say I was a college teacher. So um, that's what I did. So. The first year, which was 66, 67, there were three full-time faculty, Peckham, Harry Kuna, Helen DePeace, who later became Helen Reddy. And when I came on board, there were now 12 of us. Don't ask me to name all of them. I don't think I could. David Werblow was one of them. Mary Staggs was one. Richard Patrick came on midway through that first year. He came in January of 68. Um, and it was kind of an interesting experience because everybody had the same schedule. Because we taught Monday through Thursday, we all taught two courses on a Monday, Wednesday, and two courses on a Tuesday, Thursday. And it was like a faculty meeting every day before classes because we'd all gather in the cafeteria, um, waiting for our rooms to be available, and uh, then go and teach our classes and get out of there around 9, 9.30 at night and go back to do it again. So it, um, it was an interesting beginning. I, one of the things that surprised me was that the average age of students was 28. And uh, I was 23. 
<laughs> so a lot of students were old, some of them many, much older than I was. And uh, very, I had been to two private institutions. I hadn't had any experience in community college, didn't really have a clear sense of what a community college was. And uh, I got there and started to grasp the concept and started to really like the concept. It was a, a kind of a real democratic college, small d democratic college. And uh, so I enjoyed it. I had one year and then I was called away by the United States Army uh, for two years. There was a war going on back then. And uh, a lot of people thought that the uh, brunt of the war was being borne by uh, poor and in many cases minority folks. So the, the rules changed and they started going after the college guys who had had deferments or had had occupational deferments. And so I was swept up in that and uh, spent two years in the army away from the college. And um, Where were you sent by the army? I was uh, sent to do medical research in at Letterman Army Institute of Research in San Francisco, California. And I was specifically assigned to diseases that guys were getting in Vietnam. And uh, what I was involved with was going to Vacaville Prison in California. You may have heard of that. That's where Sir Han, Sir Han went. And giving prisoners diseases. They volunteered for this. They weren't major diseases. And then testing various cures for them. Um, uh, that led to some interesting stuff for me. I was one of the diseases they were getting. Do you want to go into this kind of stuff? One of the diseases they were getting was called miliaria, which was basically a skin rash which after the rash went away, the sweat glands were occluded, so they couldn't sweat. Vietnam was 100 degrees, 100 percent humidity. If you couldn't sweat, you were going to die of a heat stroke pretty quickly. So we were giving the prisoners this um, disease and then testing various treatments to return their sweating function. Um, that led to, uh, near the end of my time in the Army, I was assigned to work for NASA at Moffett Field in California. And I went down there because I had published a, a little paper, published in the Journal of Investigative Dermatology, which was basically, it was called, the title was Evaluation of the Symmetry of Sweating on the Back, because that was one of the things that I had observed. We had a machine called a pseudorometer. And we gave the guys these diseases and then we would try to restore the sweating function by various medications. And the way we measured the sweating function is we had this capsule, uh, plastic capsule through which we could pass air, which had a sensor in it that had formerly been used to measure small amounts of moisture in jet fuel, but we were using it to measure the amount of moisture coming off the skin. Well. NASA <clears throat> was having a problem with astronauts who were walking outside their vehicles in space and sweating and their face masks were all fogging up so they couldn't see anything. So I got invited to go down to Moffett, Moffett Field with our pseudorometer, work with their engineers down there and we worked on um, trying to find a way to attach sensors to the astronaut's skin that would allow their sweat rates to be monitored. And the astronauts wore underwear, full length legs, arms, even hoods, which had tubes running through them filled with water. So the idea was that they, the sensors would measure the amount of sweating they were doing, and then the computer would control the temperature of the water flowing through their underwear which would cool them down so they didn't sweat. We had uh, 
a devil of a time figuring out how to attach the capsules to their skin so it would stay on. We tried the old EKG belts, all kinds of stuff. And eventually we found the best thing that worked would super glue. We just super glue the capsules to their skin. So they were they were gonna have six, I think, six capsules attached at various places on their skin. So actually the engineer I worked with, I can't remember his name now, but he he wrote a paper about what we were doing and the pseudorometer itself. And it was accepted for publication. Then I got out of the Army. So I'm back here in Connecticut, working at Middlesex. And my wife and I were riding along one day with the news on the radio. And the news said, the astronauts returned back from space. Uh, they were all in very good health, uh, except for some skin irritation where they had sensors attached to the skin. And I said, that's my sensor. <laughs> so that was what I, I knew it actually got tried out. So, all right, where were we going anyway? So now you're back at Middlesex well, after two years in the Army. Two years in the Army, I came, oh, and this comes to your question. Two years in the Army, I came back, and Middlesex was moving into Connecticut Valley Hospital. Wesleyan University had remodeled some science labs, and probably Wiley Peckham had gotten them to donate all of their old lab equipment. Well, this was big lab stuff with heavy stone uh, counters on it. It was pretty heavy stuff, but we moved it ourselves. And we in the science department were in Stanley Hall. And attached to Stanley Hall was a long, narrow building they called the Tin Shed. So the chemistry lab was set up at one end of the tin shed where we logged in these heavy pieces of lab equipment and the biology department was set at the front of it. And uh, so from the time I left when they were 12, 13, when Patrick came, faculty had grown quite a bit and apparently it had been a controversial two years. I'm sure Nagel and Childs talked about that. Um, where Phil Wheaton and and one faculty member in particular were uh, going at it quite publicly in the newspapers and students were taking one side or the other. But um, I fortunately missed all of that and came back to uh, an, a new setting. We could now have daytime classes. We had offices. My office had bars on the windows and no handle on the door for the inside. It was a former cell, and a number of us had cells. I remember Skip Wiley had a cell not far from my cell. The business department was also in that building, and President Wheaton and some of the administrative staff were also in that building. The math people were in a different building. I can't remember the name, but it was, a, you know, not far away. <laughs> and when they were looking around for space to clear things out so that they could get set up to operate as a department. They found uh, a number of brains preserved in jars. <laughs> so, so that became the excitement of the moment. Um, but um, we really, getting back to daytime classes, day and night classes, but being able to have daytime classes uh, I think the college had a nice little expansion at that time, and then uh, in the meantime, plans were underway for this campus, which uh, we moved to in 1973. And um, I remember the, uh, the arrangement of the buildings being described as two shoe boxes and a hat box, <laughs> which would be the, the, you know, Snow Wheaton and Founders Hall. But, um, From there, there was a lot of support um, politically from the Middletown area for the college. Uh, I'm sure you've heard people say that one of the founders, uh, Robert Snow, was for a brief time governor of Connecticut and still held considerable sway in Middletown politics. So the college was 
treated pretty well. Um, the, my first year, we were not a separate college, we were a branch of Manchester Community College. And I think it was in 68, while I was away, we became a, a college on our own. Um, I may be wandering too far astray. Um, what's next? Um, what were some uh, friendships that you developed over those sort of early years of the college, and what was the uh, culture of the school sort of like in those early years? Um, I worked with Skip Wiley quite a bit. So Skip Wiley, and well, actually Skip had been at Wesleyan with me, uh, so we were friends. Uh, there was a, a pretty active social circuit in those days. Um, David Werblow and Ann Cassidy were famous for their parties. Uh, Reno Petty Ross and his wife were famous for their parties. Um, so we tended to rotate around through one another's houses. Um, my impression was a great deal more than, than is done or was, has been done in recent years, probably even into the late 90s. But, um, a spirit of building something together. Um, you've, heard, you've heard about 425 Hunting Hill Avenue. That was the college. Uh, Phil Wheaton had an office on the first floor. Bradley Biggs had an office on the first floor. I think Ed Vader was upstairs. Marilee Lyon, uh, guidance counselor, was upstairs. Uh, Marion Dudding was the uh, receptionist and she sat behind this big board where you plugged in all these various wires to when a call came in to send it to a particular office you would plug this into the hole in the board that represented the phone in that particular office so um, you it was a sense of you were in something together at the very beginning. Um, and uh, one of the things that I really enjoyed that was a part of the early college was they were called PSA meetings, Professional Staff Association meetings. They were monthly, a chance for everybody in the college to get together, particularly worked well when we got onto this campus. And all committee reports uh, recommendations went to the PSA for approval by the entire staff. And uh, there were many famous and uh, dramatic debates that took place about various things that were being proposed, particularly curriculum committee, but, but all committees would send things to be uh, approved and then eventually on to the president. As uh, time went on, you eventually became a dean. How did that sort of come about? Um, 1982, uh, Robert Chapman, president at the time, was asked to go to, he succeeded Phil Wheaton in 1976, I'm going to say. He was asked to go to Tunsis Community College to be interim president. And Eduardo Marti, who was the dean of faculty at the time, uh, became interim president at Middlesex, and they asked me to be the interim dean of faculty. We did that for one year. Chapman came back. Chapman was a great president, by the way, in my opinion. Uh, liked working with him a lot. Um, Chapman came back, and Marti left and took a presidency somewhere in upstate New York, I think. So they asked me to stay on for another year as dean of faculty and while they did a national search. So I threw my name into the pool for the national search. It's always interesting being an internal candidate because everybody knows you, warts and all, and they all have opinions about your strengths and weaknesses. So uh, that all comes out when you're a candidate. Um, but I went through the process and went through the board of trustees interviews and uh, remember being at home one late afternoon when Bob Chapman stopped by the house and offered me the job. So I became the dean of faculty for a very brief time. 
um, they changed the job. They added responsibilities to it. There used to be community services, which were non-credit and credit courses, but which were run separate from the state budget. They, it was possible for it to become a profit-making enterprise, and in fact it was. And um, so that was moved to me. It had been under the Dean of Students, and when the Dean of Students retired, they gave it to me. So I got a change in title. I was now the academic dean. There was no change in pay, oh, by the way. <laughs> it's just uh, more stuff to do. But uh, that, let's see, that's so it was. 84, I guess, I became the academic dean. And uh, so I like to say I was the last dean of faculty at the college. <laughs> and, uh, so you talked about a sense of togetherness among yeah. the faculty. When you moved up to dean, do you feel like having that title kind of changed your relationship with them or made it better or worse? You know, it's interesting. I was a little worried about that coming from the faculty. I thought, well, how am I going to be able to supervise the faculty when I was just one of them the day before? But I was quite surprised at people's attitudes toward me almost immediately. It changed right away, and uh, that was fine. And uh, I set up a few things. Um, we used to have uh, a meeting every couple of weeks of all the uh, division heads or department heads. And uh, I also had the library under me, and I also had uh, it was called AV then. I don't know what, what it's called now, but that was under me as well. So we would all gather every couple of weeks. It was very, it was a great working group. And one of the great things about it, I thought, was uh, we could discuss whatever we wanted and uh, had great confidence that anything that needed to be kept confidential would be kept confidential. So I was very happy with the, the working arrangement I had with, with all the uh, various academic and library and AV heads. So uh, for me, it was a very pleasant time. And I, being a faculty member was the best. Um, I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed all the time I had with students. I enjoyed seeing them go on to have various kinds of successes. Um, I enjoyed some of the recognition I got for it. I remember my first year back from the Army, I went to, the, I went to uh, Dean Biggs. Um, you have to remember, the environmental movement was just beginning at that time. And I said to Dean Biggs, I'd like to teach a course in ecology. And he said, what the hell is ecology? I mean, it was not a, a, a known phenomenon like it is now. And uh, I explained to him, he let me offer a course in ecology. Um, and I turned it into at least a 50% field ecology course. We did freshwater studies, we did animal population studies, we did uh, forest studies, we did at least half the course was outside work. Um, and uh, interestingly, uh, Wesleyan had an ecology course, but they only taught it every three years. So I would get Wesleyan students coming over and taking the ecology course here because uh, it didn't fit their time frame otherwise. But um, it, uh, as I said, the environmental movement was just starting at that point. The, um, the course itself was actually written up in a few places. I guess, too, I wrote a few articles about it. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, I think it was 1971, um, the National Wildlife Federation named me Connecticut Conservation Educator of the Year and gave me this big trophy, <laughs> which still collects dust on my office shelf at home. Um, so having the environment starting to become more and more a part of the public consciousness made it easier and easier to get funding. 
Uh, Skip Wiley, who I've mentioned, was very, Skip was a very, a good chemist and a good guy with machinery. And he was applying for grants and, and we honestly had uh, equipment that um, uh, even four-year institutions didn't have. Um, Oh, I can't remember the student's name. We had a student who finished here and went over to Wesleyan. Wesleyan got a grant to study heavy metals in dredge spoils coming out of the Connecticut River. Wesleyan didn't have a machine to do that. So our graduate, who is now a Wesleyan student, came to Middlesex and ran all the samples on our atomic absorption spectrophotometer. and. Uh, Wesleyan wrote it up and never mentioned Middlesex, by the way, and then got its own atomic absorption. But infrared spectrophotometry, Skip would go to these companies like Perk and Elmer and talk to them about what we were doing, and they would give him equipment. He had a very nice instrumentation lab that he built up, uh, which was good for the students, because now students were ahead of the curve in terms of getting out, knowing how to use certain kinds of equipment. and. Uh, just being able to, in some cases, go on to other schools and, and do well. Um, one of my favorite student stories, can I tell a favorite student? A kid from East Hampton, I'm not going to tell you his name, but he was told by his high school guidance counselor, you're not college material, so don't even think about going to college. Came to Middlesex, he stayed here five years part-time, full-time, combination, back and forth. And um, he worked on a, I, I, I did a project for the town of Middletown, which used four or five Middlesex students. It was basically analyzing uh, mosquito populations in the city and, and uh, where control needed to be taken. And this guy did, I bet there's still a copy of this booklet around. We published a report at the end of our, our summer. And he did eight and a half by 11 drawings of mosquito larvae, this big, full page, microscopic detail that he, he literally sat and looked through a microscope and, and drew. Well, after five years, he decided he wanted to do some more. So he went on to the University of Connecticut. And he got a bachelor's degree. And then he got a PhD from the University of Connecticut. And I tell you, I couldn't have been more proud of him. And he, his, he had been told, you know, yeah, don't bother. Not, not for you. Um, another guy I think of, he was an army vet, came in. And a uh, very smart guy. And uh, finished here. And he was going to go to UConn. And uh, I said, I'll give you a piece of advice. I said, live in a dorm. I'm not going to live in a dorm with all those 18-year-olds. He said, he's an army vet. And I said, look at this. You wake up in the morning, you get downstairs, you get your breakfast. Somebody cleans your bathroom. I said, oh, very convenient for you. No, I'm not going to do it. Well, I saw him a few months later. He was living in a dorm, and he said, you're right. And he, he's another one that went on. He went on to University of Iowa became a Fulbright scholar, and he went down to South America to study the reproductive habits of alpine guanacos. Well, guanaco is some kind of llama, apparently. And the last of them I heard, after that, he went to North Carolina for a PhD program. But there were other people. There was a student who, um, because of the his uh, experience with the equipment, the environmental equipment we had, he actually started his own environmental monitoring company and ran it for many years. Uh, he's probably retired now. But um, it's uh, just having that experience with such a variety of students, it was, uh, it was it's great to see what changed, how things changed in their lives. And, um, then being a dean was good too. I enjoyed having a little broader influence. Um, so 
if I can think of something. Oh, hi, here's an example. Um, there was a big push while I was dean to try to get more minority faculty hired by in the community colleges. So, I, as the academic dean, I was in charge of the part-time faculty budget. So I went to Bob Chapman. I made a proposal to him. I said, "How about this? How about if we find a minority graduate student and we hire them with our part-time faculty budget for one semester, where they?" Uh, are tutored by an experienced faculty member so they get an idea of what it's like to be a, a faculty member at a community college. And then I said the second semester we'll hire them as a part-time faculty member to teach a course, to put, in, put to work what they had, um, had learned in their semester as being mentored. And um, Chapman thought that was a good idea, so we did that. And the presidents of all the colleges met once a month, back when there were all, a lot of colleges. And um, he told them what we were doing here. And they liked it, and they adopted it, and it became known as the Minority Fellowship Program. And that actually originated right here at Middlesex Community College, uh, which was kind of a nice thing to see happen. Um, one of, my, one of my big errors as dean actually kind of went the same way. Um, I, I thought it would be nice if we had a faculty prize for teaching excellence. So I went to Chapman and um, he had put aside a, a bunch of money for what he wanted to do. He called it a featured speakers program. And I said, how about if we take some of that money and award a faculty excellence prize every year. He said, what are you thinking about? I said, $5,000 prize. And surprisingly, he said, okay. So I put the, put the um, idea out through my division chairs. And to my surprise, it was not widely liked. Uh, my count trying to get a handle on things was, was probably 50-50 uh, among the faculty. And uh, I didn't want to push it forward with that, what I consider to be a fairly weak response. The main argument seemed to be uh, it was divisive. Um, we ought to be thinking about all faculty and not just, I mean, there was, there was a union aspect to it. Um, and the, the, interestingly, uh, I can say this now because he's no longer with us, the lead opponent was, um, oh boy, I've forgotten his name now, Lee. Lee was in your department. Lee Barnes? Lee Barnes, yeah. Yeah, the main opponent was Lee Barnes. So. And Lee was always, no, we need to elevate all faculty. And so I got a in my mail, I got a, an announcement for a seminar. To, I think it was in Wisconsin, which was basically um, how do you how do you get faculty how do you improve faculty teaching at community colleges? So I sent them an email, and I said, "Hey, why don't you go to this?" And he said, "Find me the money, and I'll go." So I went back to Chapman. I said, "You know that money I asked you for for teaching excellence?" I said. How about if you use it to send Barnes out to this seminar? He said, what? He said, he was the main guy that sank your idea. And I said, yep, he was. But I said, I've talked to him, and I think what we'll do is send him out there, and then we'll come back, and we'll have our own seminars based on his experience here on campus. So uh, Chapman agreed, and Barnes went. And when he came back that fall, we started uh, running monthly seminars for faculty. Um, I, I did one of them myself, talking about, you know, things to be aware of the first day of classes for community college students. Well, Chapman went up to the president's meetings and he talked about what we were doing, and they said, that's a great idea. Why don't we do it for the whole system? So that became known as the Barnes Seminar. You, you were here when that was going on. Down at the Mercy Center where you know, faculty from all the colleges would go, and talk about various ways to improve teaching. So there's a couple of things that uh, 
came from being dean that worked out to be system wide. Um, I did, actually was just reminded of something when I saw Dan Nocera. Um, we lost the community services capabilities sometime toward the end of when I was a dean, but they decided they didn't want the colleges holding on to all this money. They wanted all the money being paid as regular tuition and going up to the central office for distribution. And at that time we had accumulated, um, I was supervising that, Judy McGrath, who was excellent at uh, putting out programs and stirring up interest in them, we accumulated close to a million dollars in community services. So Dan Nocera at that time was being asked to make videos for training purposes for various uh, agencies. I think DEP was one of them. And um, he didn't really have uh, the best kind of equipment for doing that. So I made a proposal at our president's meeting. I said, how about we take $100,000 out of community services, buy the equipment, and so that Dan O'Sara can start making industrial, we called them industrial videos then. And uh, you will remember Bob Berg. Bob Berg was Dean of Administration at that point who could pinch a nickel until it screamed. Uh, he blustered and fussed about it, but uh, eventually the President's Council approved it. And then I was brash enough to say, and we'll pay you back within a year. And by the way, we did. And uh, so Dan got his equipment and it, that has grown into, I don't know if he's, does he still do the same thing? Every day. Yeah. And uh, that was, uh, was another thing. I see you get, when you become a dean, you get a chance to try things and teaching excellence prize might not work, but the barn seminar might work. So it was fun to do. I, I tend to go on too long. No, no, that's fine. It's good. Now, good stuff. you retired in 1997, correct? Yes. Um, were you involved in finding, well, who replaced you, first of all? Um, okay. there, there was a series of interims. Right, right. And then... Um, what was it, Marianne something? She was temporary, yeah. yeah. And then I think Samuels was the permanent. Samuel Samuels was yeah. the permanent replacement. Yeah, maybe after a year or two, yeah. Now, did Middlesex consult you on finding out who to, well, who to replace you? Because you were dean for, what, 10 years? I was dean for 15, 15 years, yeah. No, uh, they did not. Um, I, I immediately started part-time teaching after I retired. Um, and the, they were, the department head was happy to have me because I would take times that nobody else wanted, like 8 o'clock in the morning and things like that. <laughs> but uh, uh, I kind of stayed away from it a little bit. Um, there was a new president, and uh, she she changed the entire dean structure. As a matter of fact. Now you're talking about uh, Sullivan. Hart. 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 Yeah, she. Bird, dean of administration, wound up leaving to go to uh, as Nuntuck, finish out his time, and Needham, dean of students, uh, did not come back from working with a banner project up in Hartford. So she changed the structure. So it was pretty new to me. And then um, I don't think she would have wanted my input anyway into it. Complicated. <laughs> um, when did you start doing your, uh, your nature tours um, when you go see eagles and all of that? I remember you used to do that. That was pretty much informal, but. Um, I have a federal bird banding license. Had it. Which is what? Uh, the federal government gives me permission to capture birds and put bands on their legs, and, and uh, as long as I report accurate records back to them. Um, and I uh, actually used that in some of the, the ecology classes. We would do some bird banding as part of it. Um, being here on campus, by the way, allowed us. We, I called CVH police and got permission to use the uh, reservoir up here for our freshwater studies. Before that, we'd been driving out to a Girl Scout camp in Lebanon. And um, 
because there were woods right we would do animal population studies. We'd have a, we use what's called a mark and recapture technique. We'd set out a bunch of traps and capture animals and then we take a little dab of paint and put it right at the base of their tail before we release them. And they, there's a statistical process which allows you to estimate the size of the population by the percentage of what you catch that are recaptures, ones that you've already marked. <laughs> I remember one day a student came in, Mr. Cargan, Mr. Cargan, I said, what? He said, there's a dead possum out in the trap. I said, oh, let's go see. I figured it might be a teaching opportunity. So. I went out with him and there, sure enough, was a possum lying out in the bottom of the trap with his tongue hanging out. And I said, watch this. So I took a stick and I tipped the trap over so the door flopped open. Then we went and hid behind a tree. And eventually the possum opened one eye and looked around. And then he stood up and scampered off. And I said, you've heard the expression playing possum? I said, that was a vivid example of it. Uh, but gave us the opportunity to, to do things like that. And I mentioned way, way long ago in this interview that um, I spent a lot of my childhood in the woods and studying nature and learning about nature and that became my, uh, my academic interest as well. So it's fun. You were there for quite a long time. Over the years, um, how would you say that teaching at Middlesex changed, especially in light of sort of advancing technology? Yeah. Um, that was the major change. Um, I, I left before um, uh, remote teaching became as widespread as it did become, and of course with COVID, became virtually the only way, but um, personally, I didn't think I would like it. I liked the, being in a classroom with students. I liked having the interaction of the challenges. Um, so I never did remote teaching, but it became more and more widespread, and basically it allows larger classes, which makes administrators happy sometimes. And um, it, uh, Have you done it? I mean, it's a lot less personal to me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, it, it's a different experience. It's very convenient, but but you do lose the, uh, you know, that familiarity uh, with the students. I um, there was a young woman who was here for a year or two in biology. Young PhD. She went on to St. Joseph's University. Anyway, she asked me to. I was retired then. She asked me to, if I'd do bird banding for her class, and I said, sure. So we came up and we set up nets up past the, uh, what used to be the soccer field. And then um, we went back and did a classroom part of it. And um, I think she had a rule of no phones in the, in the classroom, but I didn't know that. So. I was talking about a particular study on birds that showed how different species of warblers could exist in the same tree by occupying different kinds of tree. And I said, oh, take out your cell phone. I said, uh, look up Blackburnian warbler. So they all got their phones out and typing in Blackburnian warbler. I said, okay, now take, um, look up yellow warbler and look at bay-breasted warbler. So I was having him look up to see what all these birds I was talking about looked like, and afterwards she said, hmm, I never would have thought of that. <laughs> so so um, from that point of view, for me, it was the, a, a good use of technology. And I, um, here's the thing, information is so much more readily available now. However, you're never totally sure that all that information you're getting is accurate. And I would think as a faculty member nowadays, this new AI business where you give it a topic and it writes a term paper for you or takes your medical board exams or law exam boards, I mean, that's, that's frightening. I mean, you've got to be 
you got to be great at technology just to know how when that's being used when it shouldn't be. Um, I, I can barely do email, so I'm, um, well, I can Google stuff too, but. And, and John, what do you most, pro I mean, when you look back on your career here and your colleagues, what comes to mind more than anything else? Uh, I mentioned it already, being part of uh, building this uh, has to be, the, uh, I mean, I told you what I thought going in. I don't know if this place is even going to last. Mm -hmm. And then being in on the ground floor, having a chance to be a part of building it, a terrific experience. Meeting a lot of great people, um, getting exposure. You know, when you know, the dean, I'd have to go to meetings at the 12 other camp 11 other campuses. I'd have to go to meetings at the central office. So I got exposure beyond that as well. And uh, it was, uh, I loved the teaching. I liked being the dean. Um, I like being asked to go back and be the master of ceremonies for all these retirement <laughs> ceremonies that I've been asked to do. It's just keeping... Well, you were the boss, so we figured... <laughs> well, oh, I thought that was because I was good at it, but... 